Hello everybody, welcome to this service for the second Sunday in Advent. It's good to be with you. Andrew is going to lead us in some opening devotions as we light the second candle on our Advent wreath. Welcome to worship for this second Sunday in Advent. As we begin our worship today, we light the first two candles on our Advent wreath. Let's pray. We light these candles for all God's prophets, confronting injustice and restoring the dream of a world of freedom and peace. God, as we wait for your promise, give light, give hope. Amen. Later in our service, we're going to hear the opening words of Mark's account of the gospel of Jesus, where John the Baptist comes into the wilderness and says, prepare the way of the Lord. Something that we're seeking to do this and each Advent. Prepare ourselves and prepare the place we're in for the presence of God. And so as we gather to prepare our hearts and minds for God to come to us, we're going to sing, these are the days of Elijah, reminding us that those words, prepare the way of the Lord, sort of echo through the ages. These are the days of Elijah. Shining 
Let's pray. God, you have been kind to us through the ages. You've been kind to your people and looked on us with mercy, given us many reasons to turn to you in praise, which we do now. Praising you for the way you have called uh, your prophets and preachers of the past, like John the Baptist, to come and inspire the people around them to be ready for you. The way you have moved and offered words of wisdom and insight and comfort. The way you've challenged your people to be faithful in this world you have created. Lord, help us prepare ourselves now as we come before you. Help us prepare ourselves to worship you, to encounter you, to hear from you, and be changed by you. Prepare all that we are, our hearts and our minds, our bodies and our souls, for this moment of worship. So Lord, as we do ask you to do that, we hold before you our weaknesses, that you would work on them, that you would Acknowledge our sins that we hold before you in confession and forgive us. That in our times of ignorance you would give us insight. In the times of uncertainty and quiet you would give us our voices. And in the times of speaking, you would remind us of silence. Whatever it is we need to hold before you, for you to prepare us to encounter you, please do so now. Help us know your renewal in our lives. Help us know your forgiveness in us. Help us know the gifts you give to us, that we might worship you truly this day and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to hear our two readings now. Firstly, a reading of Mark's opening words of his account of the Gospel of Jesus and the entry of John the Baptist. And we're going to follow that up with some words from Psalm 85. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. The beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare the way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptising in the desert region, and preaching the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. A reading from Psalm 85. You showed favour to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints. But let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, 
and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. In that psalm we heard the words that steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss one another. As an image of the coming of the Lord into our lives and all that that might mean. We're going to have a hymn now that reminds us of that coming of Jesus. But with a reminder of a very different kiss that happened in Jesus' life. As we take a bit of a moment to think on the fullness of the story of Jesus from his birth through to his death and resurrection, as we look forward to also to his coming again, from the squalor of a borrowed stable. From the squalor of a borrowed stable, by the spirit and a virgin's faith, to the anguish and the shame of scandal came the savior of the human race. But the skies were filled with the praise of heaven. Shepherds listen as the angels tell of the gift of God come down to man at the dawning of Emmanuel. Now the friend of sinners Humble servant in the Father's hands Filled with power and the Holy Spirit Filled with mercy for the broken man Yes, he walked my road and he felt my pain Joys and sorrows that I know so well Yet his righteous steps give me hope again I will follow my Emmanuel Through the kisses of a friend's betrayal He was lifted on a cruel cross he was punished for a world's transgressions He was suffering to save the lost He fights for breath, He fights for me Loosing sinners from the claims of hell And with a shout our souls are free Death defeated by Emmanuel We standing in the place of honor, crowned with glory on the highest throne, interceding for his own beloved, till his father calls to bring them home. Then the skies will part as the trumpet sounds, hope of heaven or the fear of hell. But the bride will run to her lover's arms Giving glory to Emmanuel Yes, the skies will part as the trumpet sounds Hope of heaven or the fear of hell But the bride will run to her lover's arms Giving glory to Emmanuel I'm going to welcome Matthew Dorrit now to share some of his own reflections with us before we hear Andrew's reflections on those Bible passages for us. Today, I want to share a few words from a book I was given on the occasion of my baptism last year. 
Soul Fuel by Bear Grylls, one of the world's best known adventurers, is an inspirational daily devotional. Bear Grylls is famous for many things, including being a member of the SAS, but he uses this book to show how every adventure in his life is grounded in his Christian faith. I have been really inspired by the devotional passages in this book. There are so many that just inspire me in so many different ways. But today I'm going to read a short reflection entitled Selfless. To a lot of us, it seems logical to take control and put in the maximum effort to make sure our plans come off well. But getting too caught up with our own plans for our, lo- for our lives, families and careers is living with their eyes turned inwards, and eyes turned inwards lose their effective vision. The Bible constantly reminds us that empowered, meaningful living is about trusting God and living and loving radically. We see it in the lives of everyone who has had lasting, historical, biblical impact. Noah and Abraham, Daniel, Esther and David, John the Baptist, Peter and Paul. They all lived differently yet were rooted in faith and stepped out in courage. God wants to be involved in every area of our lives, to bless them and to increase our vision beyond ourselves. If we want to our work to have lasting value, we need to make sure we are partnering with the source of all light, love and power, not proudly going it alone and in the wrong direction. The Lord will fulfil his purpose for me. Psalm 138 verse 8 He will. Christ is our ultimate resource and he has a huge purpose for your life. Trust that promise. Follow his ways. Listen to his whispers. And he will take you on an adventure like no other. Let's pray together. Loving God, we pray that as we think about your written word to us in the Bible, You may speak to us of your living word, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. It all happened a long time ago, one snowy winter's evening, when a group of us, as students, decided we'd enjoy the particular scene outside by going snowballing and sledging on a hillside just on the outskirts of the city of Durham. I particularly enjoyed sharing a sledge with one of the female students from our group. And so it was that as the evening progressed, the other members of our group seemed to almost melt away into the background, leaving just the two of us alone on that snowy hillside. As I looked down at her, she gazed up at me with those beautiful dark brown eyes. I hugged her and our faces neared one another. Her lips approached mine for a kiss, and as I leaned in towards her, I kissed the zip of my anorak collar, which got in the way. What a romantic! Well, Susie and I still laugh when we remember that moment all those years ago. In times of hardship and difficulty, It's not surprising that we may look back to happier moments. Perhaps even we might imagine a golden period in the past, which may or may not have actually happened in reality. But you know what they say, nostalgia's not what it used to be. When the psalmist in Psalm 85 looked back on the past, he wrote, You showed favour to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortune of Jacob. But when he wrote those words, he wasn't wistfully looking back with a sense of dreamy nostalgia, hoping to return to that past. Rather, his recollection of God's mercy and goodness in the past inspired him to pray for his people and for their experience of God's mercy right there and then and in what lay ahead for them. And it may well be that he was writing at a time of hardship. It's possible that this psalm was written after the return of the people from exile, at a time when they were struggling to re-establish themselves within the land of Israel. 
And yet the psalmist is prompted to speak with great confidence of God's character and God's attitude to his people. He promises peace to his people, his saints. Peace that is not just the absence of conflict. Peace that is that experience of contentment and well-being under God's care. And he speaks of God's glory dwelling in our land. The people of Israel were used to the concept symbolically of God dwelling within the most holy place, first within the tabernacle and later within the temple in Israel. But here the psalmist speaks of God's glorious presence dwelling throughout the land with his people. And this leads him to that marvellous poetic vision in verse 10, when he speaks of love and faithfulness meeting together, righteousness and peace kissing each other. The following verse is almost a commentary on that poetic verse, when it speaks of God's love, the divine love, coming down to take hold of human faithfulness, and of God's righteousness approaching God's human well-being to embrace it as with a kiss, but not with the anorak getting in the way. It's a vision of harmony between God's initiative and our human response that according to the psalmist would have tangible effects for the nation with good crop yields as a result of that blessing from God. And the psalmist concludes Psalm 85 by speaking of God's righteousness, preparing the way for this fruitful, harmonious state for his people. But what does that mean? It's easier said than done. How can God's righteousness prepare the way for that kind of wonderful experience of peace and blessing? According to Mark's Gospel, a key part of that preparation of the way for God's blessing on his people was the mission of John the Baptist. Mark is very clear that John was the one who fulfilled the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 40 of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. John did that through his ministry of calling others faithfully to be repentant, to turn away from their ways, to turn towards God and to receive a baptism of forgiveness. John's ministry, his words, were backed up by his own lifestyle described in that passage from Mark chapter 1. One of selfless, self-denying living that he might pour himself out in giving this message that he believes God has sent him to deliver. But the message of repentance and forgiveness is not the final word in John's mission and ministry. For he goes on to point ahead to one who would come after him Whereas John had baptised with water, the one who would follow him would baptise with the Holy Spirit. That is, he would enable, inspire and equip God's people to live in God's way. John prepares the way for Jesus, the one who fulfils not only the hopes of John and Isaiah and the psalmist who wrote Psalm 85, but the hopes of all those who long for God's presence among his people, for God's right ways to be established in our time, in our land. If you want to know what love and faithfulness meeting looks like, if you want to know what righteousness and peace kissing each other looks like, then look to Jesus. As Charles Wesley put it, in him, earth and heaven combine, the incarnate deity, our God, contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. Pause and wonder at that amazing truth. Our God, contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. 
pause. But don't stop there. As the psalmist made very clear, God coming to us in this way is meant to have tangible consequences for our experience of life here and now. Last week in our worship, we shared in a hymn that said, he came down that we might have love. He came down that we might have peace. Not just 2,000 years ago in Israel, but here and now in 2020. And he came down not that we might have those things just for ourselves, but that we might have love and peace in such abundance that we can share it with others, giving ourselves in active care for those around us, expressing God's peace, God's right way of living, God's faithfulness and love in who we are and what we do for others. Too often, and for too many of us, this time of preparation in the build-up towards Christmas can be a stressful and exhausting period of stocking up and filling up. This Christmas is doubtless going to be quite different in many ways, not least because we're not going to be able to meet with some of our loved ones who we would normally enjoy spending time with over the Christmas period. I certainly share that frustration at the prospect of not being able to be with some of my family. But I want to invite you this Advent to share with me in preparing in a different way. Looking to Jesus, looking to meet with him because he's available for every household. Meeting with him in his love and faithfulness receiving through him God's righteousness, God's right way of living and experiencing his peace, his contented well-being as if it were a kiss. And remember, don't let your anorak collar zip get in the way. Amen. Thank you, Andrew, for opening up the scriptures to us today. We're going to turn now again in song. Let earth and heaven combine as we reflect on that wonder of heaven and earth coming together, of God and humanity dwelling together. Oh 
about our own personal failings being brought close to God, that we would be transformed, prepared completely. We remember also that the world is in need of God's closeness for the failings and troubles of the world to be healed by God. And so we're going to pray now. God of hope and peace, who came into this world that the world might be changed, that the whole of creation might be renewed, that the whole of the universe might find its fulfilment in you. We hold before you that world today with its brokenness, with its hurts, and pray, come Lord Jesus, to your church, broken and divided as we are. Come, Lord Jesus. To places in the world crying out for righteousness, for wisdom, for justice and peace. Come, Lord Jesus. To all the hospitals and care homes around our country and world. Come, Lord Jesus. To those living with anxiety or stress or illness this day, come Lord Jesus. To those close to our own hearts in need of your blessing this day, come Lord Jesus. Come to this world, Lord Jesus, in your mercy, hear our prayers which we offer to you. As we conclude by saying the words you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to conclude our service now with a not very well-known hymn, uh, but one that Charles Wesley wrote in his collection of hymns on the Nativity, which picks up again on some of those themes in that psalm that we heard. The first two lines are, All glory to God in the sky, and peace upon earth be restored. We sing. Oh, to thy creature. 
sharing with us and thank you especially to all those who've been involved in our service today. We close with a short prayer. God, come to us. Come to this world with your peace and righteousness. Level the mountains and the valleys that create divisions and hurt. Prepare us and all your people for your coming. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen.